Welcome to Hear God Every Day. I'm your host, Sarah Witten. Get comfortable, open your heart, and let's talk about how we can be more sensitive to God's voice in our everyday life. Welcome back. This week, um, I just really feel like this episode is for some specific people out there that are just wondering and praying and asking God, like, God, did you change your mind? Um, Whether it's struggling to know if they heard correctly or, you know, just knowing that God had spoken to them and said a certain thing, but then now it's just looking completely opposite or you're feeling like that message has changed. Um, You know, I know this is something that is, it's a pain point and it's something that, you know, I've struggled with too at times of just knowing like, okay, what is going on? Did God change his mind? Does God change his mind? When God speaks something to us, you know, does he change it? Does he change his message? Does he change his callings, you know, kind of mid route? Um, and what does that look like? How do we, how do we navigate that? So, um, I'm going to pray. And I just really feel like this kind of where God is taking this is going to bring, um, a lot of peace and a lot of freedom. And so God, we just ask you to, to come Holy Spirit and, and just do what you do best. God, bring clarity, bring freedom, bring release. And Lord, I just pray for, um, for confirmation for those people who are listening, who are just wondering, you know, what's happened and, you know, is your word still good? God, that you would confirm to them that not one of your words falls to the ground void um, without accomplishing what you intended it to. God, give us new eyes to see what you're doing in this season. Help us to see our timing correctly. And God, help us to um, not impose our own interpretations and our own ideas of what your fulfillment looks like, God, but help us to truly see um, that you're a God who does what he says he's going to do. And Lord, just build our faith with the testimonies and reminders of what you've already done. Because God, we know that you have so much more that you have yet to do, that you are not a God who changes, Lord, and that you're a God that can be trusted. And so I just pray that this week is a week of building trust with you, God, that if there's one thing that you would accomplish through this this episode and this time with you this week, it would be building trust. And so we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So, you know, as I mentioned this, this topic of, you know, has God's word changed has his mind changed? And when I'm talking about his word, I'm not talking about his biblical word. I'm talking about his word to you, um, his purposes and callings on your life. Sometimes as we're pursuing those callings or as we are kind of living the fulfillment of a word God's given us, we can get to this point where everything is just looking so opposite or Maybe we have, you know, not seen a lot of progress or maybe it looks different than we thought. And so we're at this place where we're asking God, like, did you change your mind? Did you change your mind about what you said? And um, it brings us to kind of the bigger question in hearing God, which is, does God change his mind? Does God change his mind? And, um, you know, as I really prayed into this, I felt like God just kept bringing me to different places in his word and, um, giving me almost questions to answer that question. You know, so when we're asking God, did you change your mind? The first question that God asked me back was, you know, what did I originally say? So a word to you if you're in this place of wondering if, you know, the plans have changed, has God changed his mind? Ask yourself, what did God originally say? And for this, I think of Moses. So, you know, when you go back to Exodus 1, right, God is, um, you know, calling him 
Um, I mean, really, he's got this this purpose, this destiny for for Moses that is set up even in the very, very beginning of Exodus at his birth. But um, when we fast forward to, let's see, it's chapter three, God is specifically giving him his his word, if you will. He's giving him his call. And um, he's saying, the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. And I'm aware of their suffering. And I have come to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. But that's not all he says. He also says, um, you know, just a few verses later, he says, let's see. I know, this is verse 19, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. And as I read this, I noticed, because it's so easy for us when we're reading someone else's story, right? We're not living it. Um, You know, in our story, we're just grappling to put together the pieces and, and, you know, it's not as easy to have that, that kind of bird's eye view, but With Moses' story, as we're looking at, you know, his interaction with God and how we're hearing God, you see all of these places along the journey, you know, as you continue reading in Exodus, you see all these places along the journey where Moses doesn't say, but kind of hints at like, God, have you changed your mind? Like, what is going on? Um, One of them being when he complains after they increase the labor on the Egyptians, you know, when Moses first goes and talks to Pharaoh. And um, so Moses kind of says to God, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Um, Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue them. And that last line is basically like saying, hey, everything you said you were going to do, you've done none of it. Have you changed your mind, God? But when we go back to what God originally said to Moses or in our own life, if we're looking at our own words, like in Moses' word, for example, when God originally speaks to him back in chapter three, he says, First, that he's leading them into a fertile and spacious land that's flowing with milk and honey. Okay, so as they're wandering in the desert, when you fast forward, when they finally, you know, have their exodus and they're wandering in the desert, how many times do the Israelites collectively, and I'm sure Moses in in, in that respect too, how often do they wonder, like, okay, God said he's leading us out of Egypt into our own fertile and spacious land, a land with milk and honey. Yet they're wandering in the desert and there is no milk and honey. And so they're wondering, okay, did God change his mind? God also tells them that It's a land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, all the ites now live. Yet, when they get to the border of the land and they send out the spies, um, you know, of course, this is with Joshua and Caleb. When they send out the spies, it's like they forgot what God originally said. And they came back and were like, well, there's all these people 
in the land. We saw all these people that are living there now that occupy it that are basically giants compared to us. So reading between the lines, I'm paraphrasing here. Basically, God must have changed his mind because this land is taken. Yet God originally said they would all be there. He also told him that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. He didn't say the king of Egypt will not let you go unless you ask him. Yet, in some ways, I feel like reading that Moses kind of expects like, okay, I'm going to ask him and he's just going to let us go. And God says in his original word that he's going to raise his hand and strike the Egyptians and perform all kinds of miracles among them. So he kind of lays out that roadmap at the very beginning. Yet that discouragement and that that protest from Moses that says, you know, you haven't done what you've said that you would do since the first day you sent me to Pharaoh is coming from not God having changed his mind, but a lack of Moses's clarity. And so as I was sitting with that, you know, the Lord was saying that many of us, when we're sitting there wondering, has God changed his mind on his calling for me? It's not a changed mind, but our own lack of clarity, our own kind of forgetting what God originally said. And so if you're in a place of feeling like, I just feel like everything is changing directions. This is not what I expected. Um, I don't even know if I heard correctly anymore. Go back and ask God, hey, remind me of what you originally said. If you're a journaler, go back to that first place when you first heard. Remind yourself, what did God originally say? Because sometimes what we think is God changing his mind is actually us lacking clarity, us forgetting what he actually said. The next question that God gave me for the question of God, have you changed your mind? He asked back, have your circumstances changed? So for this, I think of Joseph um, in Matthew 2. And it's like a few short verses. Um, It makes it just sound so simple and easy. And I think that's why it's hard for us because for our journey, it's never just a simple and easy few short verses. We feel like we're kind of agonizing in the process and in the waiting for way longer, right? Um, But for Joseph, you know, it says that he was warned in a dream not to go back to Herod and they returned to their country by another route. And when they had gone, um, this is Matthew chapter two, verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Okay. And so Joseph does this. He's obedient. And it says he stayed there until the death of Herod. And when it was fulfilled, then again, a few verses later in 19, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. Now, while Joseph was obedient and, you know, didn't seem, at least, you know, it doesn't record him being confused or wondering, you know, okay, God, are you just going to keep leading me on this wild goose chase? For some of us and for some people listening, I feel like this is very relevant for you, that God um, had maybe called you to something different. And so you had moved on to this different thing. And then the season had done its work. The season had passed. Now you're in a new season. And God is kind of bringing 
back around old things. He's maybe calling you back to um, an old place or an old group or an old profession, you know, that you had set aside, um, kind of reviving old things. And you're wondering, okay, God, did you change your mind? Was I not supposed to set that down in the first place? Um, you know, what, what's going on? Why am I going backwards? It feels like going backwards. But in those times of wondering if God had changed his mind, because you feel like you're returning to something that, you know, you had been called out of in a previous season. I'm not talking about a sin because that's very different. When God calls you out of a sin, he's not going to ever call you back into a sin. But I'm talking about specifically things like, you know, like I said, careers, relationships, um, things that, you know, uh, maybe were in a past season and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, not bad things usually, but just, you know, God had called you onto the next thing and then they're coming back up. So for those of you who are in a time like this, God's saying, it's not that he's changed his mind, but it's that your season has changed, which again, what's crazy about both of these is, um, you know, with, with the Moses example, with the Joseph example, that in both of them, God never changed. God never changed. It's something in our circumstances that has changed, whether it's our perception, whether it's our timing, it's usually us that changes. It's not God changing. And then the third question um, that God kind of asked back to me when, you know, I asked him like, hey, have you changed your mind? Is, does it look different than you thought? Which is a hard one for us because automatically we think that we are just the best at um, conceiving these plans for our life. Like the things that we can dream up and think of or the ways that we would solve the problems in our life. Like we think that they are the absolute best solutions. Um, (laughs) And I'm sure God laughs at that. But uh, when we hear a prophetic word that's like, oh, God's going to fulfill that, but it's going to look different than you expected. I think for many of us, we automatically assume a downgrade. You know, um, actually in, in a book that I just recently published um, in Uncommon Vessels, there's a piece, um, an image that God gave me in it where, you know, I talk about this and, um, you know, I say we, we see God as the parent who, when we ask him for a car, he gives us a Hot Wheels. But really, God is the parent who, when we ask for a Hot Wheels, he gives us a car. Um, it's usually on a much more complex level, better than we could ever have dreamed of for ourselves. And I think our best example of this, because again, when we go to the word and we read those stories, like, you know, hindsight, we, in in our bird's eye view of being able to see the whole picture, um, we get to see those examples in a way that we don't always get to see our own life. But, um, you know, God reminded me of Jesus and how all of his really disciples and followers at the time had a really different idea of how God was going to fulfill those promises through Jesus, thinking that he was going to, you know, overthrow the Romans, thinking he was going to be this fulfillment, but in a very different way. And actually the way that they were expecting while they thought it was better, it was way more limited, right? So with that example seeing it on this side of the resurrection, we see that the way that Jesus came to fulfill God's words, A, that it fulfilled all of them. Like none of those words fell to the ground. He 100% fulfilled them. But also that it was in no way the way that they were expecting. And so I ask you, if you're in this season, does it look different than you thought? Maybe God has not changed his mind, but maybe you need to change 
your idea of how he's going to fulfill that because he wants to give you more than you thought. So I was looking at, you know, just the places in the word where it talks about, you know, God changing or not changing. Like, you know, does God change his mind? Does God change? And um, the verses that I was drawn to are Psalm 55, 19. God will hear and answer them, even the one who sits enthroned from of old, with whom there is no change and who do not fear God. God will hear them and answer them, the one who sits enthroned from old, with whom there is no change. Psalm 102, 27, but you are the same and your years will not come to an end. You are the same. Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. I love that too, because God not only says he doesn't change, but he also says that because he doesn't change, we're not consumed. And then everybody knows Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And finally, James 1, 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So, you know me, I took those and I went a little deeper. Um, in the Greek, there's a couple words for, for change. Um, one of them is shana, and it means to fold or to duplicate. And by implication, to transmute, to do again, alter, be given to change, disguise, pervert, All of these things are definitions of that Sean word. And when you hear these words like pervert, disguise, duplicitous, those words to me don't describe the Lord, but they do describe the enemy. And the enemy would love for you to think, oh, God has changed. Therefore, because when things change, they're not reliable and therefore can't be trusted. And so shaking our confidence in trusting the Lord is exactly what the enemy would love to do. There's another Greek word, alasa, which is to cause one thing to cease and another to take its place. There's somebody listening right now who feels like God has given them this word, and they're wondering if God is causing it to cease and replacing it with something else. And you're needing to hear that God will never go back on his promises to you. It may look different. It may be in a different timing. You may need to go back and remind yourself what exactly it was that God said, but he will never go back on his promises. This word, alasa, means also uh, to speak in a different manner according to different conditions of minds or to adapt the matter and form of discourse to mental moods. Basically saying, when somebody changes what they say based on how they feel. That unstable parent, maybe, that gets angry and goes back on their word. Or that unreliable spouse who, um, you know, in, in a fit of rage, goes back on something they said. And if that's been your experience, that's what people are like, but that's not what God's like. God 
God doesn't change. Um, and then lastly, that Greek word um, for changing or for staying the same. Let's see. So it's the James 117 where it says there's no variation or shifting shadow. Um, Psalm 102, you are the same and your years will not come to an end. When it says the same, that Greek word autos signifies nothing more than again applied to what has previously been mentioned. So it's saying what God has previously said, it's nothing more, nothing less. It's just again. And that is the word that God uses to describe himself as the same. So in terms of promises over your life, God is only ever going to speak over you what he has previously said again and again. He's not going to take it back. He's not going to be deceptive or duplicitous or disguise it or pervert it or change it or take it away. And if you are in a place where you're wondering, has God changed his mind? God's purposes and callings for you have not changed. The way they look compared to what you expected in a great way may be different. But this week, in your time with the Lord, you know, I don't have a long list of questions. It's just going to be simple. I want you to ask the Lord to remind you again what he originally said. That's it. It can be about anything. Whatever that specific thing is right now that Holy Spirit's putting on your heart, in your time with the Lord this week, ask him, remind me again what you said. Because God will never change. He'll never go back on his word. And in every single instance that I mentioned today, in the instance of Moses, in the instance of Joseph, in the instance of Jesus, in all of those places where God gave them a word and where God's plans for them didn't change, even when they felt like God was changing his mind, in every single instance, the answer was obedience. And that's our answer too. It's remembering what God said and then being obedient to do it and to do it in season and to do it in the way that God is calling us to. Um, so. I just, I will be praying for your God time this week. Lord, just, just speak clearly and remind each and every person listening uh, what you said and what obedient steps to take, Lord, where to go next, because we just um, are hanging on your words and we're excited for your plans. And so um, with that, I, I'll have more resources for you at arrowsofzion.com. Um, if you want to send me a message, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and otherwise, I will see you back same time next week, and we will dive into more of hearing God every day. Thanks for spending time with me today. If God spoke to you through this time, visit arrowsofzion.com for writings, resources, and ways to partner with me in reaching the unreached with the gospel. You can also find Arrows of Zion on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Have a blessed day, and let's meet here next week.